starting the recording. Um, and um, I want to start with introducing. So uh, I, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Lisa Dunier, who is our colloquium speaker today. Uh, Lisa is an expert in uh, stellar astrophysics and specifically magnetic fields and pulsations inside of uh, lower mass stars and uh, also higher mass stars, I would say, but we'll see what Lisa thinks about that. Uh, and uh, Lisa did her PhD in on the CEA in Sacré, outside of Paris, I think it's located, and she graduated in 2020. Uh, in 2020, she got the flat tire on CC, uh, CCA Fellowship uh, in New York, and um, it has a uh, and has since then been a, a fellow in, in New York. And um, just last year, she uh, she got a, a so she, she got a new job in Austria, and uh, it will move to Austria in the beginning of the next year as um, a faculty at a new institute uh, called ISTA outside of Vienna. So that is really exciting to see what's going to happen in Lisa's career and how she's going to take the science. Um, but so I hope that Lisa can give us a bit of a preview for that and where uh, all the cool stuff that she's been working on. I definitely encourage you to sign up to meet with Lisa. So I'm going to start actually with just sharing that link in the chat there uh, so that you all can uh, find um, in the schedule and there is still some open slots this afternoon. Uh, so, but with that, let's uh, uh, welcome Lisa and Lisa, you can start sharing your screen, and get going whenever you feel ready. Thank you, Eva. Um, can you see it? Yeah, that looks good. Okay. Well, thank you very much for for this introduction. Um, I'm very nice. I'm, I'm very happy to 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 give this seminar today. Uh, thank you very much for for the invitation. Um, so I'm Lisa Bunier. I'm currently a research fellow at the Flight Iron Institute in New York, um, and I work on stars, on low mass stars like the Sun, um, and specifically on red giants, which are low mass stars that have evolved past the main sequence. And I'm trying to probe um, the, what is happening inside the star, inside the radiative interior of red giants. Uh, and I focus on the, the detection of magnetic fields inside these stars. This is something that uh, I hope I will convince you that it is very hard to do, but not impossible. Um, so today we talk about stars. Um, the reason why I, I'm focusing on them and the reason why many people study stars is because they are the cornerstone of the universe. They form in galaxies, they form in molecular clouds, uh, and then they affect the way the galaxy will evolve, they, they affect the last structures. Um, and so what I want to talk to about today are stars from the main sequence towards the later stage of the evolution before the low mass star becomes a white dwarf. Uh, so it's this about uh, five giga years of lifetime that I'm, that I'm going to focus on today. Um, so this is important for planetary system, for the understanding of stars themselves, of course, and for life structures. So in stellar physics, we have, we have gone through a very big evolution during the past, let's say, 20 years. Uh, it used to be very much focused on nuclear physics, the formation of the elements in the universe. And this is still something that people are working on, of course, um, but we have expanded the stellar physics field um, by um, sending uh, space missions such as Kepler and TESS that have been observing stars in the past 10 years. Um, and it, it allowed us to see stars as objects that evolve in time, um, that have a that have a lot of dynamical processes taking place on the inside, such as rotation, uh, we are also able to understand in more depth how this how is the structure inside the star, where is the limit between the core and the envelope, and how do they change? Uh, so this is all exciting studies that took place very recently. So it's a it's a field that has been expanding uh, in the last 10 years. 
Um, no, thanks to these two space missions and with the Plato space mission that is coming as well, um, we are looking forward to understand the dynamic of stars even better. Um, and the reason for that is we have a few issues with um, observations and theoretical prescription stellar modeling that do not match. And one of them is what we call the problem of the angular momentum transport inside stars. This is a problem that is happening inside all star, all, all ages um, and all mass. Uh, when we try to reproduce, so this is the radiation rate on the y-axis versus evolutionary stages uh, on the, the x-axis. Here is uh, the subgiant branch and the red giant branch is over there. Um, what we can see is that if we try to reproduce the observed rotation rate inside the core of red giant, which are green dots here, with current stellar modeling when, when the at much higher rotation rate than what we observe, uh, which means that there is at least one physical process that takes place inside the core of red giants that slows down that's their spin. And this process, it is not included in stellar modeling. So we are missing something, at least one thing. Um, and this is very important because stellar modeling are, are the one that provide ages uh, in the universe. So if we're missing an, an important physical process, if the rotation rate are not correct, it means that our estimates of ages are not correct as well. Um, so this has been uh, a, a problem that we had since 2015 approximately, uh, and we haven't been able to solve yet. Uh, we have several candidates that could explain why the core of stars rotates slower than expected. Uh, it could be transported by waves, for instance, by oscillation, and I will mention that a little bit later. Uh, and one of the main candidates in order to explain the fact that star rotates slower than expected um, would be magnetic fields, um, simply because magnetism freezes rotation. It makes the star rotate mostly as a solid body. Um, and magnetic fields are not included into stellar evolution models. This is, this is a, a major missing piece in, in, in what we are able to reproduce currently. So the next step in stellar physics is going to an understanding of magnetized star. Uh, how does magnetic field impact the chemical mixing, mixing the evolution of stars, and also the interaction with planets? So, we need to understand magnetic field from the surface of the star with the interaction with the interplanetary medium and also on the inside because this is where uh, it will affect the most the evolution of the star and this is this is what i'm focusing on magnetic field inside stars so here what i present is one of the scenario that could explain why stars are magnetized in their radiative interior. This is something that we call the foresight field scenario. Um, it comes from the fact that during the evolution of stars, at some point there are episodes where the core is convective. Um, it can be on the pre-main sequence uh, where the star starts as being fully convective at the beginning. It can also be on the main sequence for the intermediate mass star above 1.5 solar masses, where the star is expected to develop a convective core. We know that convection generates dynamo action. This is what we observe at the surface of the sun. We have a, a dynamo magnetic field with a cycle of 11 years. And so we can expect a similar thing happening inside the core of the star on the main sequence. Then the question is what happened to this magnetic field that is generated inside the core and during the pre-main sequence also, this is what is represented here, when the convection ends on the inside, then the dynamo magnetic field that was unstable uh, could relax and form a large scale stable magnetic field. This is a numerical simulation that was uh, made a few years ago, which shows that from a completely stochastic field, we can end up with a very stable fossil field configuration. And such a strong magnetic field would then remain trapped inside the radiative interior of the star for the rest of its evolution, because once a stable field is formed, um, the, 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 the time for it to, to dissipate is much longer than the lifetime of the star itself. So if such stable magnetic field is formed inside the star, it should remain there. 
and it, it should affect the evolution of the star on the later evolutionary stages. So that's one way to form strong magnetic field inside stars, um, stars like the sun and then red giants. There is another mechanism that has been um, published a few years back um, that will generate also internal magnetic fields inside radiative interior without needing the dynamo action. Um, this comes from an instability generated by both rotation and um, small, scale, small scale magnetism that is due to a little bit of motion in the plasma. Uh, so this mechanism is fairly new. We haven't been investigating it a lot uh, so far, and is expected to generate magnetic fields that are a little bit weaker in amplitude than the fossil field scenario. Uh, in my work, I've been focusing on the fossil field scenario. This is a first step, but of course, this mechanism should also um, be studied in, in more detail. But I will not talk too much about it today. Um, so if we want to try and detect magnetism inside star, uh, we cannot really use spectropolarimetry, which is what is commonly used to, to map magnetic field at the surface of stars, simply because we cannot look below the surface with, with that method. Um, the only thing that we have been doing so far is um, 3D modelings of magnetic field, the relaxation, the relaxation of a stochastic field into four side field, we know that, that it works pretty well, um, but it doesn't reproduce, uh, like it, it doesn't tell us if it does exist or not inside stars, right? So the only way that we have to investigate magnetic field inside star is what we call asteroseismology. So asteroseismology is the study of stellar oscillation. This is, um, the analogy of what is happening on Earth with seismology. Um, and if I show you here, when the star evolves, starting around the main sequence, it has a convective envelope. Uh, I'm talking about low mass stars here um, that have a convective envelope. So this convective envelope here generates uh, sound waves that propagate from the convective cell at the surface inside the star. And these sound waves make the star oscillate in a global way. We call it acoustic oscillation, acoustic modes, or P modes. Um, they propagate in the whole star, and this, this uh, we have been able to detect them in the sun. That was the first stars for which we saw them. It's like the five minutes oscillation. Uh, and now we have been detecting them on the main sequence and on the red giant branch as well. Um, when the star keeps evolving after the main sequence, we are also able to detect another type of oscillation, which is called a gravity wave. Let's keep that, yeah. So starting from the subgiant phase, we are also able to detect the presence of gravity waves that propagate only in the radiative interior of the star. They're excited by the convection at the interface with the convective envelope that goes and creates gravity wave on the radiative interior. Um, we expect this gravity wave to also take place, takes place inside the sun. Uh, it is simply that we are not able to observe them. But starting from the subgiant phase toward the later stage of the evolution, these gravity waves have uh, frequencies that are very similar to those of the acoustic waves above, and therefore they are able to couple to form what we call mixed modes, PG modes, that are mostly acoustic in the envelope and mostly gravity, mo gravity modes in the core. Um, and they are very precious to us because it means that if we are able to observe these oscillation modes, then we are able to probe both the surface, what is happening at the surface of the star and what is happening inside the core. So we actually know more about red giant star than we know about the sun because for the sun, we're not able to probe inside that, that core. Uh, so this is the same thing on the red giant branch. We still observe this mixed mode. Um, so that, as I said, it's very similar to what we, we do uh, with seismology on Earth, where we look at an earthquake and then see where uh, the wave propagates in order to find the epicenter and also to probe um, the internal structure of the Earth. This is how we knew that we had a core and so on. And on the star, the only difference is like this is we do not observe seismic wave, but we observe global oscillations because we have waves that are excited at the surface of the star at every moment, everywhere. 
and they, they propagate and they resonate and they form global oscillations, right? Um, so the way that we are able to, to understand this oscillation and take and, 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 and get information from them is the fact that when a star oscillates, it makes its global luminosity change. Um, so this is, for instance, uh, an, an experiment made on Earth with water on top of a speaker. If you make the speaker make a sound, and it will generate vibration in, on the layer of water. Uh, and this is basically the same thing as what we will observe for a star. The global luminosity of a star is affected by how the star oscillate. So if we know that, we can use what we call light curve, which is basically we record the the amount of light emitted by a star as a function of time. Um, so this is what we obtained. This is a data from the Kepler mission. Uh, we can't see a lot of things. I mean, we can see a lot of things there, but oscillations are very hard to detect. And what we do usually is to use instead a Fourier spectrum. We go into the Fourier space to create what we call a power spectrum density. What you can see here is the power associated with different frequency in the, the, the way that the, um, the light emitted by the star varies. Uh, most of this power here at low frequency is actually due to convective cells on the surface of the star. This is not oscillation. And at high frequency, we are dominated by the noise due to the observations. But here we have an excess of power in this region. And this is what we call oscillations. Uh, if we zoom on it, this is what we see at the bottom here, we can actually see that there is some kind of pattern emerging from this data. Uh, this is very regular. We have, um, we have a spacing in frequency that is defined by uh, that distance between the, the blue modes here that are dipolar modes to start at inflates and deflates um, at a given frequency. And the green modes here are quadrupolar modes like four, uh, bubbles at the surface of the star, and the yellow area corresponds to dipolar oscillations. Uh, so this is something we know very well for red giants and for stars like the sun. This is basically the projection of the oscillation on the spherical harmonics. And this is the different shapes that the star takes at every instant and combined together, this is the data that we obtain. Um, this is very precious uh, for many domain in astrophysics because from that oscillations and the frequencies of them, we are able to extract ages of the star because um, the region where the oscillation is located is strongly correlated to evolutionary stage of the star, for instance. So this, this is why asteroid seismology started being important in the last few years, mostly to, um, to measure ages in, in a very easy way. Um, so we know, for instance, that the activity at the surface of the sun and the surface of other stars affects the oscillation. So on, on this plot is represented uh, a shift in the frequency of the oscillation that we observe, depending on the angle of, of uh, the star that we observe, these are simulations. And we can see that um, if, if, we, if we have magnetic activity at the surface of the star, then the, the frequency of the oscillation are gonna be excited are a bit different. Uh, magnetism is supposed to modify amplitude, frequencies, damping rates, and everything of the oscillation. And this is something we know at the surface of stars for the dynamo magnetic field. Now, the question that I'm asking here is, can we actually use asteroid seismology to go and probe magnetic fields that are below the surface that are inside the radiative interior of the star? And I want to start by um, going through what we can um, do from a theoretical point of view. Um, so this is the work that we have been doing in the past 30 years, um, trying to see if asteroid seismology could help us unveil internal magnetic fields. So starting from that power spectrum density here, um, there is two ways that we can use this oscillation. We can look at their amplitude and their frequency. This is mostly what we usually do. Uh, and we are trying to see if the presence of magnetism can affect either of them. Um, one of the recent results that actually got me working on this subject is um, this discovery by um, 
by actually many people pretty much at the same time. I'm not gonna say who was first. <laughs> um, so what they actually saw is that you have here at the top a poor spectrum density for very classic red giant, what we were used to observe. And at the bottom, uh, what you can see is what we call a suppressed red giant, where um, the amplitude of the oscillation in the red region are much lower, and the green region also. Um, this actually corresponds to dipolar and quadipolar oscillations, uh, while uh, and, and the blue region as well, the blue is quadripolar, sorry, and the green is uh, octupolar. But the, the radial mode, the, the black ones are not really different in amplitude. So this discovery actually represents, Superstar actually represents almost 30% of red giants. So it is quite a large number. Uh, and they mostly, um, they mostly correspond to intermediate mass stars. Uh, so they are the one that develop a convective core on the main sequence and that could uh, have a strong magnetic field on the inside. Uh, so there have been a theoretical study by Fuller in 2015 that showed that if we consider a strong magnetic field inside the radiative interior of the star, then this magnetic field could um, modify the gravity waves into magnetogravity waves. And, and the property of those waves would prevent them from escaping the radiative interior and would prevent them from coupling with the acoustic modes at the surface. As a result, we will only observe acoustic modes at the surface for the dipolar case here and the quadrupolar as well. And this field will not affect the radial mode at all. So it, it matches very well what, what we observe, which is that intermediate mass stars that could have a foci magnetic field on the inside show low amplitude in their oscillation. So this is something that, that works pretty well, but is also highly controversial because it is hard to prove that it is a magnetic field that is actually provoking that. It, it's not something that we can easily prove. Um, so what we wanted to do next is look at the frequencies of the oscillation, the individual frequency, and see if uh, they are exactly where they were expected or if there is a shift uh, in the frequency that could be due to magnetic fields. And to that, we needed theoretical prescriptions. And this work actually started a long time ago, um, in the 1980s, uh, with a lot of theoretical investigation on how internal magnetic field could affect the acoustic modes in the sun, could affect gravity modes also. Um, they also studied different type of pulsators. Um, gamma already stars more recently. And in the last few years, uh, we have been investigating how magnetic field could impact mixed modes, the ones that have both an acoustic and a gravity component and that allow to probe the core. So I want to talk about it a little bit. Uh, what we have been doing is simulating a red giant star by using the code MESA and gyre. Uh, so we simulate the, the star and we simulate the mixed mode that we expect to see if the star is not magnetized, not rotating, very easy. And then we, we come and take those frequencies of the oscillation and perturbate them uh, due to the rotation of the star, typical rotation rate that we have measured, and due to a magnetic field stable with uh, the simplest configuration that we could think of in order for the field to be stable. So this is this one. It's both a poloidal and a toroidal magnetic field that is aligned with the rotation axis of the star. And we took an amplitude of one megagauss, which is huge, but is compatible with what we would expect to have if the field would come from a four-side uh, dynamo field that was previously there at, uh, during the main sequence. So we come and perturbate all these frequencies. And what we actually see I'm going to skip that one. So what we actually see is that if we take one oscillation mode, one dipolar oscillation mode, and we add the rotation of the star, we obtain three oscillation modes that are because the rotation will come and lift the degeneracy between uh, the different azimuthal order of the mode. This is the same thing as, as we do for uh, atomic physics and the spherical harmonics. Um, uh, rotation leads to degeneracy, right? Um, and we end up with a symmetric triplet. This is something that we know, and this is how we were actually able to measure rotation rate inside the core for giants by looking at, at the distance between those three modes. 
And then from, from this study, we also discovered that if we add magnetic field inside the pole star, then we still have a triplet, but this triplet is made asymmetric. Um, M equal one and minus one are shifted a lot more twice the amount of what the M equal zero mode is shifted. And they are all shifted towards higher frequency. Um, which means that if in astro seismic data, we are able to detect asymmetries in the frequency pattern, it could be due to magnetic fields. Um, then the second thing that we observe is that the shift, this is what is represented here, the shift in frequency is much higher for oscillation mode that are low frequency than for oscillation that are high frequency. So we should see a shift in the frequency due to magnetism that is very strong at low frequency in the poor spectrum density. So this is a, a very characteristic pattern, uh, if I can say that. This is something that not any other known physical mechanism could produce very easily. Um, but so far, it hadn't been detected, right? When we did this study, we had um, uh, we had around 20,000 red giant stars that have been observed by Kepler. And many of them have been, have been studied already to measure rotation rate, and no one said, hey, there is asymmetry that look weird. Um, so it seemed like uh, the impact of magnetism would be very weak on the frequency, which means that the amplitude of the magnetic field might, might not be strong enough in order to be detectable. Um, so if we go, so this is just the fact that the inclination of the magnetic field inside the star doesn't change much, but uh, I'm just gonna skip that a little bit uh, and go to observations. Uh, very recently, this is a study that has been posted on archive uh, in the past month and that, not have, that haven't been um, really published yet, but it's about to be accepted. It's a study by Lieta, uh, 2022, where they found for the first time three red giants that show asymmetries in their multiplets. So you can see here it's a multiplet that is dominated by the gravity component. So that corresponds to oscillation mode that probe the deepest layer of the star. And this one is uh, another uh, triplet for the same star that is mostly dominated by the acoustic components that will probe a layer that is a little bit above the core. But in both cases, we can clearly see that there is an asymmetry. It's not symmetric. Um, so they found three stars like that and were able to estimate that the magnetic field that will lead to that result were about 0.1 uh, megagos, so 10 ki uh, 100 kilogos, which is, which is compatible with what, with what we will expect in the case of the full side field scenario. Uh, so this has been a great breakthrough, uh, if I can say that, because we have been looking for it for a very, very long time, and we're pretty happy that this has finally been found. Um, so the question is, is it was super hard to find three of them. Can we find more and actually have uh, a consistent study and, and know for sure if, if the majority of our giants are magnetized and what it, it implies for stellar evolution? So I've been working recently on trying to find a method to detect magnetic field inside star that do not rely on individual uh, oscillation modes because they are very hard to measure. Uh, if I show you here, three power spectrum density that I've been simulating, so they are very simple ones. Um, the first one is for a normal star that do not rotate, so it's not really a normal star, but does not rotate uh, and is not magnetized. The second one, I added the rotation, so something we know. And then I added the prescription for magnetism that I just presented to you, the asymmetry. And this is the power spectrum density that we expect to have. Then the problem is, in observation, we also have noise. And that noise comes and makes everything so much harder because then we don't know what mode is actually physical, what comes from the noise. And this is a typical level of noise that we will expect. So it makes it much harder to distinguish between a case where there is magnetism and a case where it's just a rotating star. And that's, I think, the reason why we haven't been able to detect many stars with magnetic signatures. Um, so the method that I wanted to do, uh, that, I, that I did, is to try and take such power spectrum density and use global asteroid parameters to try to find magnetic fields. 
Uh, we know, for instance, that there is a typical distance between two acoustic modes, which is called delta nu, is the last large uh, separation, the large frequency separation between acoustic modes. Everything that is in between those modes are dominated by the gravity components, so they are the ones that are interested for us because they probe the core. And what we can see is that we have not so many gravity modes here, and we have a lot more at low frequency. So they are not evenly spaced in frequency, as opposed to acoustic modes that were that are evenly spaced. We actually know from, from the physics of gravity modes that they are evenly spaced in periods because they are buoyancy, that they are restoring force of buoyancy, and it's something that works in period and not in frequency. Um, so what we can do is stretch this data to have according to that function and to make up to have a typical period spacing appear in the gravity mode. So this is what it what how it works here. If we stretch the data according to that function, then we have gravity mode that are even spaced in this new coordinate that is a period. Then if we add magnetism to that to that to that thing, um, the typical spacing between the modes should change a little bit because we're shifting the modes due to magnetism. And we know that magnetism does not affect modes the same way, depending on whether they are at low frequency or high frequency, as opposed to rotation that does the same thing to all the modes. So the basic idea here of the method would be to cut the spectra into, um, into different pieces and then measure this typical spacing between the modes and see if it is always the same or if there is a change in that. This is what I show here. I've been calculating um, the spacing between the peaks at, on, on five different frequency ranges in the, pores, in the stretch for spectrum density. Uh, this is all simulated stars. This is not real observations, right? And if I do not include magnetism in my simulation, then we can see that low or high frequency, the period spacing between the gravity modes is typically the same. Now, if we add the effect of magnetism, we can see a dependency on the frequency of this asteroid parameter that we call delta pi one. That is something that we, we use, we, we measure it a lot in, in a lot of our giant star, but we actually never really measured it locally on different orders. Um, so this is something that I, that I just finished doing. And I think that we can apply that to many stars that have been observed fairly easily because we do not need to, to study the individual oscillation modes in the poor spectrum density and see if we are able to find that law here that is actually physical, that is a function of the frequency and, and the amplitude of the magnetic field. Um, to try to see if we're able to detect more stars that show signatures of internal magnetic fields. Um, the last thing that I wanted to mention is that there are other types of stars in which we can go and try to find signature of magnetic fields. Uh, I can think, for instance, of white dwarfs uh, that are uh, the descendant of these red giants. And we know that um, around 20% of white dwarfs have strong magnetic fields at the surface. Uh, so they could come from this uh, fossil field that could be trapped inside red giants. And then when the star loses is its envelope, uh, the magnetic field emerges at the surface. This is, this is something that is possible. We have that also for neutron stars. And, and recently we have been discussing with Ilva to try to see if uh, we could go and try to investigate magnetic field inside her strip stars. So I don't know if you're too familiar with what Ilva is doing, but basically when you have uh, a, a binary uh, with massive stars and you have mass transfer happening, uh, you end up with one of the star that is stripped of its envelope. Um, and in that case, if there were a four star magnetic field inside the core, it, it could be a steel industry star, maybe outcropping the surface, and it could be a good way of, of going and, uh, and try to probe magnetic field inside, not red giants, but like what, it, what happened from it. So I'm going to leave you with that, and I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lisa. I'm going to remove the spotlight so I can see people. Uh, excellent, yes.
thank you so much, Lisa. This was really interesting, and happy, I'm happy you, you end with the strip stars, of course. Um, and uh, let's see if we have any questions. Please put up your hand virtually, and then we can start the discussions. While you're oh, okay, Lynn has a question. Go ahead, Lynn. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering how well the amplitudes are understood. So, you know, I pay attention to this field because I think it's useful, though I've never done any work myself. Um, and so my understanding is that the frequencies are predicted by you know, various physical scenarios and theories reasonably, but the amplitudes are always the challenge. Is yes. that something that matches between the observations and the theories in the magnetism aspect? In what? Sorry. What is the la uh, for the magnetism, what you're trying to probe. Yeah, so it does matter. Um, it is a bit. So this is what I mentioned here, right? So we do see we do see weird amplitudes, um, and it could be due to magnetism, but it's very hard to prove it. Uh, so the only way we have would be to go and try to study these very weak oscillation modes here and try to see what is their nature, if they are purely acoustic or if there is still a little bit of a gravity mode that managed to escape. Uh, so this is, this is where the controversy lies because in this scenario where magnetism will prevent gravity wave to cobble with acoustic modes, which will only have acoustic modes here that have lower amplitude because they will have been dissipated somehow. Uh, but then in, in real data, it is, it is possible to think that they are still, the modes are still mixed with the gravity modes, even if they are low amplitude. Uh, we reach here the level of noise in, you know, among which it is very hard to distinguish between purely acoustic modes or mixed modes. Um, so this is why I would say half the community thinks that this scenario is working very well and half of us thinks that there might be something missing there because of the amplitude, but it's, the amplitude alone cannot help us tell whether if it's it's the right thing or not. It's, it's it. okay. So it's in it's in, yeah that, that clarifies things. So the observations are in the right direction to be explained, yeah. but the theory and the observations aren't. The theory is not necessarily predicting the amplitudes correctly. So exactly. We don't know. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thanks. We don't know. Yeah. I have a question, Lisa. Um, so you mentioned that the noise is a really big issue for actually uh, measuring the magnetic field. But I mean, there is quite good data now with Kepler and also TESS. How good data do you need? Like, do you need a, a longer Kepler baseline or what would be perfect for actually being able to see this? Yeah, it's, um, it's already really good with Kepler. With TESS, it's not enough right now because we need very good resolution and low noise, which is demanding. Like we would need even more than four years of observation, right, if we wanted to go into, like, for instance, a one megagos field in the Red Giant branch, which is huge, uh, would not be that easy to detect on the frequencies. because it's, it's, it's quite small. It's like a, a few, like 0.1 microhertz of, of shifting, which is not a lot. Um, so the better the resolution, the better, the, the lower the field we can probe. Uh, so if, if we're able to have better resolution, we will be able to probe a field that have lower amplitude, which is probably what is happening actually. This is probably why we haven't been able to detect them, lots of them so far. It's probably just at the limit of what we're able to do. Okay. And so do you have any dream mission that, that may uh, res resolve a lot of these issues? I think, I think honestly, tests will start to be great in a few years when it comes back a lot on the same stars. Uh, mm -hmm. If it keeps going like that, then it will be really great in a few years. It's, it's not enough now, but I'm waiting for that. Um, the Plato mission, unfortunately, will focus on, I mean, not unfortunately, it is great, but not for that particular project, uh, because it focused on main sequence stars and we don't see gravity waves yet. Uh, so we cannot probe the interior, but maybe it will allow us to do it, so. Really exciting. 
I mean, I can ask more questions, but if anybody else has questions, of course, that's very welcome. Okay, well, then, so Lisa, where, where is it going? Uh, what do you want to do next? Do you want to share something exciting? Do you? So what I want to do next? Yeah, well, where is it going? Well, I think the, the logical next thing to do is to go and try to apply that method to data. Yeah. <laughs> so of course that's the next step. Um, then there are other things that I want to do. Um, I think it would be important to try to, lay, to, to, to try to understand how large scale stable fossil fuel can remain inside the star and how they will interact with the magnetic field that is generated in the envelope constantly by the dynamo action. And think that there could be some coping there that we haven't investigated. Um, there is also a lot of work to do with the conviction, with the convective dynamo field that is at the surface, because it should also uh, affect the oscillations. Uh, so there's something that we should be able to probe with astro seismology as well. Um, I also think that the way oscillations are excited itself, uh, even before the oscillations are formed, um, must depend on rotation and magnetic field. And this is something we do not investigate yet. Um, so yeah, all these things. And, and I, I also believe that it will be important for um, the different community because I'm, I'm from the red giant community, but I know a lot of discussion with the white dwarfs person and also with uh, intermediate mass stars where they, try, they, they are starting to, to also detect magnetic fields inside stars by asteroid seismology, but it is very different. The methods that they are using are very different. Um, so there is a lot of interaction to do there. And I think that's, that's one of the next steps. Okay, that sounds really exciting. I'm looking forward to see what's coming out. Okay, so I would say unless we have any more questions, let's thank Lisa again. Thank you. And uh, please uh, consider signing up to talk with Lisa. Lisa, you have your schedule available. And thank you so much for this very exciting talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa.